Chapter 26. <sighs> I spew the berries from my mouth, wiping my tongue with the end of my shirt to make sure no juice remains. Peter pulls me to the lake where we both flush our mouths with water and then clasp, 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 clasp into each other's arms. You didn't swallow any? I ask him. He shakes his head. You? Guess I'd be dead by now if I did, I say. I can see his lips moving in reply, but I can't hear him over the roar of the crowd in the capital that they're playing live over the speakers. The hovercraft materializes overhead, and two letters drop, only there's no way I'm letting go of Peta. I keep one arm around him as I help him up, and we each place a foot on the first rung of the ladder. The electric current freezes us in place, and this time, I'm glad because I'm not really sure Peter can hang on for the whole ride. And since my eyes were looking down, I can see that while our muscles are immobile, nothing is preventing the blood from draining out of Peter's leg. Sure enough, the minute the door closes behind us and the current stops, he slumps to the floor unconscious. My fingers are still gripping the back of his jacket so tightly that when they take him away, it, uh, it tears leaving me with a fistful of black fabric. Doctors in sterile white, masked and gloved, already prepped to operate, go into action. Peter's so pale and still on a silver ta still on a silver table. <sighs> Tubes of wire springing out of him every which way, and for a moment I forget we're out of the games and I see the d doctors as just one more threat, one more pack of must designed to kill him. Petrified, I lunge for him. But I'm caught and thrust back into another room, and a glass door seals between us. I pound on the glass, screaming my head off. Everyone ignores me except for some capital attendant who appears behind me and offers me a beverage. I slump down on the floor, my face against the door, staring uncomprehendingly at the crystal glass in my hand. Icy cold, uh, 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 filled with orange juice, a straw with a frilly white uh, collar. How wrong it looks in my bloody, filthy hand with, with its dirt cake nails and scars. My mouth waters at the, at the smell, but I place it carefully on the floor, not trusting anything so clean and pretty. Through the glass, I see the doctors working feverishly at, on PETA, their brows creasing, creasing concentration. I see the flow of liquids pumping through the tubes, watch a wall of dials and lights that mean nothing to me. I'm not sure, but think his heart stops twice. It's like being home again uh, when they bring in the hopelessly mangled person for the mine explosion or the woman in her third day of labor or the famished child struggling against pneumonia uh, and my mother in prim. They wear that same look in their faces. Now is the time to run away to the woods to hide in the trees until the patients... It's long gone, and in another part of the scene, the hammers make the coffin. But I'm held here both by the hovercraft walls and the same force that holds the loved ones of the dying. How often I've seen them, ringing around our kitchen table, and I thought, why don't they leave? Why do they stay to watch? And now I know. It's because you have no choice. I startle when I catch someone staring at me from only a few inches away and then realize it's my own face reflecting back in the glass. Wild eyes, hollow cheeks, my hair in a tangled mat. Rabid, feral, mad. No wonder everyone is keeping a safe distance from me. The next thing I know, we've landed back in the roof of the training center and they're taking Peter but leaving me behind the door. I start hurling myself against the glass, shrieking, and, and I think I just catch a glimpse of pink hair. It must be Effie. It has, it has to be Effie coming to my rescue when the needle jabs at me from behind. When I wake, I'm afraid to move at first. The entire ceiling glows with a soft yellow light allowing me to see that it, I'm in a room containing just my bed. No doors, no windows are visible. The air smells of something sharp and antiseptic. My right arm has several tubes that, that extend into the wall behind me. I'm naked, but the bedclothes are soothing against my skin. I tentatively lift my left hand above the corner. Not only has it been scrubbed clean, the nails are filed in perfect ovals, the scars from the burns are less prominent. I touch my cheeks, my lips, the puckered scar above my eyebrow, 
and I'm just running in my, my fingers through my silken hair when I freeze. Apprehensively, I ruffle the hair by my left ear. No, it wasn't an illusion. I could hear again. I try and sit up, but some sort of wide restraining band around my waist keeps me from rising more than a few inches. The physical c confinement makes me panic, and I try to pull myself up and wriggle my hips for the band when a portion of the wall s slides open and it steps this redhead, redheaded Avox girl carrying a tray. The sight of her calls me, and I stop trying to escape. I want to ask her a million questions, but I'm afraid any familiarity would cause her harm. Obviously, I am being closely monitored. She sets the tray across my thighs and presses something that raises me to a sitting position. While she adjusts my pillows, I risk one question. I say it out loud as clearly as, as my rusty voice will allow, so nothing will seem secretive. Did Peter make it? She gives me a nod, and as she slips a spoon into my hand, I feel the presence of pressure of friendship. I guess she did not wish me dead after all, and Peter has made it. Of course he did. With all their expensive equipment here, still, I hadn't been sure until now. Uh, 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 uh. As the A-box leaves, the door closes noiselessly after her, and I turn hungrily to the tray. A bowl of clear broth, a small serving of applesauce, and a glass of water. This is it, I think grouchily. Shouldn't my homecoming dinner be a little more spectacular? But I find it's an effort to finish the spare meal before me. My, my stomach seems to have shrunk to the, the size of a chestnut. And I have to wonder how long I've been out because I had no trouble eating a fairly sizable breakfast that last morning in the arena. There's usually a lag of a few days between the end of the competition and the presentation of a victor so that they can put the starving, wounded, mess of a person back together again. Somewhere, Senna and Portia will be creating our wardrobes for the public appearances. Hamish and Effie will be arranging the banquet for our sponsors, reviewing the questions for our final interviews. Back home, District 12 has is probably in chaos as they try and organize the homecoming celebrations for Peter and me, given that the last one was close to 30 years ago. Home! Prim and my mother! Gail! Even the thought of Prim's scruffy old cat makes me smile. Soon I will be home! I want to get out of this bed to see Peter and Sina to find, to find out more about what's been going on. And why shouldn't I? I feel fine. But as I start to work my way out of the band, I feel a cold liquid seeping into my vein from one of the tubes and almost immediately lose consciousness. This happens on and off for an indeterminate amount of time. My waking, eating, and even though I resist the impulse to try and escape the bed, being knocked out again, I seem to be in a strange continual twilight. Only a few things register. The red-headed Avox girl has not returned since the feeding. My scars are disappearing. And do I imagine it? Or do I hear a man's voice yelling? Not in the capital accents, but in the rougher cadences of home. And I can't help having a vague, comforting feeling that someone is looking out for me. Then finally, the time arrives when I come to and there is nothing plugged into my right arm. The restraint around my middle has been removed and I am free to move about. I start to sit up but I am arrested by the sight of my hands. The skin's perfection, smooth and glowing. Not only are the scars from the arena gone, but those accumulated over years of hunting and vanished without a trace. My forehead feels like satin and when I try to find the burn on my calf, there's nothing. I slip my legs out of bed, nervous about how they will be bear my weight, and find them strong and steady. Lying at the foot of the bed is an outfit that makes me flinch. It's what all of us tributes wore in the arena. I stare at it as if it had, as if it had teeth until I remember that, of course. This is what I will wear to greet my team. I'm dressed in less than a minute and fidgeting in front of the wall where, where I know there's a door if I... Even if I can't see it when suddenly it slides open, I step into a wide deserted hall that appears to have no other doors on it, but it must, and, and behind one of them must be Peta. Now that I'm conscious and moving, I'm growing more and more anxious about him. He must be alright, 
or the Avox girl wouldn't have said so. But I need to see him for myself. PETA! I call out, since there's no one to ask. I hear my name in response, but it's not his voice. It's a voice that pr provokes first irritation and then eagerness. Effie. I turn and see them all waiting in a big chamber at the end of the hall. Effie, Hamish, and Senna. My feet take off without hesitation. Maybe a victor should show more restraint, more superiority, especially when she knows this will be on tape, but I don't care. I run for them and surprise even myself when I launch into Hamish's arms first. When he whispers in my ear, nice job, sweetheart, it doesn't seem sarcastic. Effie's somewhat teary and keeps patting my hair and talking about how she told everyone we were pearls. Senna just hugs me tight and doesn't say anything. But I notice Portia is absent and, and uh, 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 get a bad feeling. Where's Portia? Is she with Pina? He is all right, isn't he? I mean, he's alive? I blurt out. He's fine. Only they want to do your reunion live on air at the ceremony, says Hamish. Oh, that's all, I say. The awful moment of thinking Peter's dead again passes. I guess I want to see that myself. Go on with Sinna. He has to get you ready, says Hamish. <sighs> It's really to be alone with Stena, to feel his uh, protective arm around my shoulders as he guides me away from the cameras down a few passages to an elevator that leads to the lobby of a training center. The hospital then is um, far underground, even beneath the gym uh, where the tributes practice tying knots and throwing spears. The windows of the lobby are darkened, and a handful of guards stands on duty. No one else is there to see us cross the to the tribute elevator. Our footsteps echo in, in the emptiness. And when we ride up to, uh, to the 12th floor, the faces of all the tributes who will never return flashed across my mind and there's a heavy tight place in my chest. When the elevator doors open, Venia, Flavius, and Octavia engulf me, talking so quickly and uh, ecstatically I can't make up their words. The sentiment is clear though. They are truly thrilled to see me, and I'm happy to see them, too, although not like I was, I was to see Senna. It's more in the way one might be glad to see an affectionate trio of pets at the end of a particularly, particularly different day, difficult day. They sweep me into the dining room, and I get a real meal, roast beef and peas and soft rolls, although my portions are still being strictly controlled, because when I ask for seconds, I refuse. No, no, no. They don't want it all coming back up on the stage, says Octavia. But she secretly slips me an extra roll under the table to let me know she's on my side. We go back to my room as soon as it disappears for a while as the prep team gets me ready. Oh, uh, 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 they did a full body polish on you, says Flavius enviously. Not a flaw left on your skin. But when I look at my naked body in the mirror, all I can see is how skinny I am. I mean, I'm sure I was worse when I came out of the arena, but I can easily count my ribs. They, uh, they take care of the shower settings for me, and they go to work on my hair and nails and make up what I'm done. They chatter so continuously that I barely have to, re to reply, which is, a, which is good since I don't feel very talkative. It's funny. <sighs> because even though they're uh, rattling on about the games, it's all about where they were or what they were doing or how they felt when a specific event occurred. I was still in bed. I had just had my eyebrows dry, dyed. I swear I nearly fainted. Everything is about them, not the dying boys and girls in the arena. We don't wall around the games this way in District 12. We grit our teeth and watch because we mustn't try to get back to our to business as soon as possible when they're over. To keep from hating the prep team, I effectively tune out most of what they're saying. Senna comes in with what appears to be an unassuming yellow dress across his arms. Have you given up the whole girl and fire thing? I ask. You tell me, he says, and slips it over my head. I immediately notice the padding over my breasts 
and incurs that hunger has stolen from my body. My hands go to my chest and I frown. I know it's a sin before I can uh, object, but the game makers wanted to alter you surgically. Hamish has a, had a huge fight with them over it. This was his compromise. He stops me before I can look at my reflection. Wait, don't forget the shoes. Vinia helps me into a pair of flat leather sandals and I turn to the mirror. I am still the girl on fire. The sheer fabric softly glows. Even the slight movement in the air sends a ripple up my body. By comparison, the chariot costume seems garish. <sighs> the interview dress too contrived. In this dress, I give the illumination illusion of wearing candlelight. What do you think? asked Senna. I think it's the best yet, I say. When I manage to pull my eyes away from the flickering fabric, I'm in for something of a shock. My hair is loose, held back by a simple hairband. The makeup browns and fills out the sharp angles of my face. A clear polish coats my nails. The sleeveless dress is gathered at my ribs, not my waist, largely, largely eliminating any help help the padding would have given my figure the hem falls just to my knees without heels you can see my true stature i look very simply like a girl a young one 14 at the most innocent harmless yes it is shocking that Cinna has pulled this off when you remember i've just won the games this is a very calculated look nothing Cinna designs is arbitrary i bite my lip trying to figure out his motivation I thought it'd be something more sophisticated looking, I say. I thought Peter would like this better, he answers carefully. Peter? No, it's not about Peta. It's about the capital and the game makers and the audience. Although I do not yet understand Sinna's design, it's a reminder the games are not quite finished. And beneath his benign reply, I sense a warning of something he can't even mention in front of his own team. We take the elevator to up to the level where we train. <sighs> it's customary for the victor and his or her support team to rise from beneath the stage. First the prep team, followed by the escort, the stylist, the mentor, and finally the victor. Only this year, with two victors who share both an escort and a mentor, the whole thing has had to be rethought. I find myself in a poorly lit area under the stage. A brand new metal plate has been installed to transport me upward. You can still see small plates of sawdust smell fresh paint. Senna and the prep team peel off to change into their own costumes and take their positions, leaving me alone. In the gloom, I see a makeshift wall about 10, uh, 10 yards away and I assume Peter's behind it. The rumbling of the crowd is loud, so I don't notice Hamish under, until he touches my shoulder. I spring away, startled, still half in, half in the arena, I guess. Easy, just me. Let's have a look at you, Hamish says. I hold out my arms and turn once. Good enough. It's not much of a compliment, but what, I say. Hamish's eyes shift around my rust, musty holding space, and he seems to make a decision. But nothing. How about a, 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 a hug for luck? Okay, that's an odd request from Hamish, but after all, we are victors. Maybe a hug for luck is in order. Only when I put my arms around his neck, I find myself trapped in his embrace. He begins talking very fast, very quiet in my ear, my hair concealing his lips. Listen up, you're in trouble. Where is the capital's furious about you showing them up in the arena? The one thing they can't stand is being laughed at and, and a bit of a joke of Panem, says Hamish. I feel dread coursing through me now, but I laugh as though Hamish is saying something completely delightful because nothing is co covering my mouth. So what? Your only defense can, can be you can be you were so badly in love you weren't responsible for your actions. Hamish pulls back and adjusts my hair hairband. Got it, sweetheart? He could be talking about anything now. Got it, I say. Did you tell Peter this? Don't have to, says Hamish. He's already there. But you think I'm not? I say, taking the opportunity uh, to straighten a bright red bow tie Cinnamon must have 
rustled him into. Since when does it matter what I think? Says Hamish. Better take our places. He leads me to the metal circle. This is your night, sweetheart. Enjoy it. He kisses me on the forehead and disappears into the gloom. I took off my skirt, willing to be longer, wanting it to cover the knocking in my knees. Then I realized it's pointless. My whole body shaking like a leaf. Uh, hopefully, it will be put down to excitement. After all, it's my night. The damp, moldy smell beneath the stage threatens to choke me. A cold, clammy sweat breaks out on my skin, and I can't rid myself of the feeling. Uh, uh, that the boards above my head are about to collapse to bury me alive under the rubble. When I left the arena, when the trumpets played, I was supposed to be safe from then on. For the rest of my life. But what if Hamish says... If what Hamish says is true, and he's got no reason to lie, I've never been in such a dangerous place in my life. It's so much worse than being hunted in the arena. There I could die. End of story. But, but out here, Prim, my mother, Gail, the people of District 12, everyone I care about back home could be punished if I can't pull off a girl-driven crazy by love scenario Hamish has suggested. So I still have a chance, though. Funny, in the arena, when I poured out those berries, I was only thinking of outsmarting the game makers, not how my actions would reflect on the capital. But the Hunger Games are their weapon, and you are not supposed to be able to def defeat it. So now the capital will, will act as if they've been in control the whole time, as if they orchestrated the whole events right down to the double su suicide. But that will only work if I play along with them. And Peta, Peta will suffer too if this goes wrong. But what was it Hamish has said uh, when I asked if he had told Peta the situation that he had to pretend to be desperately in love? Don't have to. He's already there, already thinking ahead of me in the games again, and well aware of the danger we're in, or already desperately in love. I don't know. I haven't even begun to separate out my feelings about Peta. It's too complicated. What what I did as as part of the games, as opposed to what I did out of anger at the capital, or because of how it would be viewed back at, uh, in District Twelve, or simply because it was the only decent thing to do, or what I did because I cared about him. These are questions to be unraveled back home in the peace and quiet of the woods, wh when no one is watching, not here with every eye upon me. But I won't have that luxury for who knows how long. And right now, the most dangerous part of the Hunger Games is about to begin. <laughs>